Shall we give the Lord a clap offering, church? Hallelujah. What a joy and a privilege for us to worship the Lord together and to study the Word of God. A blessed new year to each and every one of you, from our family to yours. We thank the Lord for this blessed new year. In this blessed new year, I want us to focus on the blessed hope of His second coming. That's the title of today's sermon. And I'm going to take you to Titus chapter 2, and let's look at verse 11 to verse 14. For the grace of God has appeared. I want you to pause there. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing, look at that word, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Praise the Lord. Twice in this passage, Paul uses that word appearance. He says, Jesus appeared. The grace of God has appeared. That happened in the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, where he came to die on the cross for the sin of mankind, where he came to redeem lost mankind, where he came to give us salvation. Hallelujah. And the Bible also says that he is coming again. The appearance, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only he appeared once, that means he came in his presence. The same thing, his presence will come again. And when he comes again, he is coming as the glorious God and he is coming as the great Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to me carefully. This is the hope of all believers. In other words, after you're born again, after you're spirit filled, after you come to that conversion experience where now you look forward to the future, what is the future that you and I look forward to? It is the future of His second coming because from then on we will be with Him forever, the Bible says. Hallelujah. That is the glorious hope. That's the blessed hope that the Bible says that we as believers have. So can I humbly say this? Is this how you begin this new year? You begin this new year with that blessed hope in your heart, that blessed hope guiding you, leading you, comforting you, encouraging you, establishing you, stabilizing you, and giving you an impetus to live for God. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says, if you believed in His first coming, and if you know that He's coming again and you are waiting for His blessed hope, then you will live a certain way in this in-between period. Look at verse 12. It says in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Hallelujah. In other words, if you believe that Jesus came the first time for your salvation and he's coming again the second time to take you to himself so that you will be with him in eternity, then you will live a distinct, a devoted, a life that characterizes that blessed hope in your life. The Bible says you will be denying certain things, you will be embracing certain things, and your life will be distinct. You live godly life in this present age. Hallelujah. I love the phrase, waiting for our blessed hope in verse 13. This is the blessed hope. You know, the world talks about hope. When the world says hope, it is usually a maybe. In other words, sometimes what they say as hope is a false hope. Sometimes when they say hope, it is an uncertain hope. But when the Bible says it is a hope, it, it has a certainty to it. Why certainty? Because it is given to us by the maker of heaven and earth. 
It is guaranteed by the word of God. If the word of God says it and you believe it and that settles it. I want you to listen to me carefully. The blessed hope in the Bible not only comes with a certainty, but it comes with an anticipation. There is a hope, there is a certainty with anticipation. In other words, it, it, it produces a certain sense of, I can't wait for this to happen. And I pray that is the orientation that you and I have as we embrace this new year. The blessed hope, hallelujah. And the word of God says that this blessed hope will dictate how we live in this present age. So I want to characterize this blessed hope and what this blessed hope does in our life. And I want to give you four things to consider this morning. The first thing is the blessed hope that purifies us. The blessed hope that purifies us. Verse 12 says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. When you know that Jesus is coming again soon, in my previous uh, sermon series on the end times, I had already established that the rapture of the church is imminent. In other words, it can happen any moment that Jesus comes again and he takes his church to be with him in the clouds. Now that event is not tied to any other event. It is a separate event. It's an event that, that can happen any moment. That means you and I ought to be ready. I wanna ask you this question. If you know that Jesus is coming again today, that Jesus will come again at any moment today, this afternoon, how would you live your life? I tell you how you will live your life. You will purify yourself. You will get yourself ready for His coming. I want you to listen to me. That's what the Word of God says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 and verse 3. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. I love that phrase, that when he comes, we will be like him. Doesn't matter what you're going through today. Doesn't matter how the church looks today. When Jesus returns for his church, the church will look like him. Hallelujah. In other words, we are transformed into that glorious body and we are caught up in the air with him. And when we meet him, we will be like him. Praise God. That's the destiny of every believer. Now, if you believe that is true, that when he returns, that we will be with him and that we will be transformed into his likeness, then the next verse is also true. And everyone who thus hopes in him. In other words, if you believe that Jesus is coming again and he's coming again for me, for the church, you will purify himself as he is pure. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. I want you to listen to me carefully. Do you have that assurance in your heart that if you close your eyes tonight, that you will be in the presence of God? That if Jesus returns today, in this moment, in this very hour, are you ready to face him? I want you to listen to me. If you understand the seriousness of it, the Bible says you will purify yourself. In other words, you will get your life right with God. You will deal with sin thoroughly. You will let go of hurt and, and, and unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. You will let go of all the things that are corrupting your soul. Why? because if you know that he is coming again soon, you want to be ready to meet him, then you will purify yourself. See, I understood this as a child. See, when I was a young boy, still in my high school, my dad would leave the house around eight in the morning and he will usually return at six in the evening. In fact, my dad is such a disciplined man that you can set the clock based on his going and coming. In other words, when he's about to leave at eight in the morning, he would say, Paul, 
I know you get distracted very easily. I know that uh, you'd, you'd be wanting to play with your friends. You play cricket all day and forget about the studies and, and the homework and the things that you need to do. But let me warn you, when I come home, I'm going to check on you. So I want you to do the work that you're commissioned to do. Go do the homework, the studies, and all that. Forget about the cricket. Now, after he leaves, I get tempted, and I will end up playing cricket all day. And then, as the day comes to a close, as the clock approaches 6 o'clock, I get into that kind of panic. I tell you this, that kind of panic that says, whoa, he's coming. He's going to check whether I did what he asked me to do. <sighs> Many a times, I have to let you know this. Many a times, I go and hide. I don't want to see him when he comes back. Why? Because I didn't do what he asked me to do. I want you to listen to me. But there are times when I have done exactly what he had asked me to do. That day, I know there is confidence in my heart. I can't wait for the clock to strike six. I can't wait for him to walk through that door. I can't wait to run and give him a hug because I did what he asked me to do. I want you to listen to me carefully. The Bible says when Jesus returns for his church, there will be people who are confident who will stand before him and they are excited to see him. But yet there will be people who shrink away from him. They don't have the confidence. Look at this in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. And now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Listen to me carefully. The day comes when the trumpet is sounded and the church of Jesus Christ is caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. There will be some who will shrink back from him in shame. Why? Because they didn't do what he asked them to do. See, over and over again in the New Testament, whether it is in what Jesus said and what Jesus taught or what Paul or apostles have written in the New Testament, you find this phrase, they that do, do the will of the Father, they that do the will of the Father abide forever. In other words, Jesus said, I have come to do the will of my Father. And John writes and says, do the will of the Father. He who, he who does the will of the Father abides forever. Listen carefully. One day the Father is going to ask you whether you did the will of the Father. This is the time, now is the season to get our life right. So when he is coming today, if he's coming this year, whether he's coming any time, we don't know when. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 100 years from now. Or it could be 10 minutes from now. He could come. Would you have that confidence to stand before him to say, Father, I thank you that whatever you had asked me to do, I did my best. And I let the Holy Spirit live and work through me. Hallelujah. That's the confidence you and I need to have. I want you to listen to me carefully. This blessed hope purifies us. This blessed hope helps us to come before God and to acknowledge that our life is not ours, our life is His. So we got to get busy doing His will. Praise the Lord. The second thing, the blessed hope that comforts us. I want you to think about this. Today, when you're going through a tough time, you're going through a dark period, you're going through a season where you have all these questions but no answers. There are puzzling things that takes place. The world is in a mess. It gets darker and darker. It gets gloomier and gloomier. But I want you to listen to me. Sometimes you don't have the answer for what the world is going through. But one day when he comes, that blessed hope will change everything. That blessed hope comforts us, knowing that one day when he comes, he will right all the wrongs. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and look at verse 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That word encourage is the word that is also translated in other English translations as comfort one another. In other words, Paul says, encourage one another. When you're going through a dark and difficult season, encourage one another. Why? Because he is coming again. I want you to think about this with me. What would you say to a person who has lost his loved one? What do you say to a mother whose baby has been removed from her? What would you say to a spouse who had just buried his loved one? What would you say to somebody who got a bad report from the doctor? What would you say to someone who is in a bankruptcy, who is going through a dark and difficult period in their marriage or in their finances or in their parenting? What would you say to them? I tell you what, what you would say is the king is on its way. Everything that you're going through that you don't understand, it's puzzling today. One day you will have the answer. The answer is not found in this world. The answer is the king will come. There are three things that Jesus will make right at his coming. Doesn't matter what the world is going through. Doesn't matter how many wrongs you see in the world, the injustices you see in the world. There is something that is fundamentally wrong that will be made right when Jesus returns. There are three things that I see in the Bible. Number one, the bride will be with the bridegroom. See, the Bible says the church is the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. And one day, the church will be reunited with the bridegroom. That means the bride is looking forward to that day when the bridegroom comes for the bride and the bride is united with the bridegroom. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 6, Jesus said this in a parable. But at midnight, there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In other words, that trumpet sound where we will be translated, that blessed hope is a hope for the bride to be attached to the bridegroom and she will be with him forever. Today as a church, the church of Jesus Christ is persecuted, tormented, marginalized. In fact, there are so many atrocities around the world that happens to the church of Jesus Christ. But one day, the bride will join with the bridegroom. And that day, all the wrongs will be made right. I want you to listen to me carefully. One day, the bride will be with the bridegroom. So as a bride, we got to get ready. You know, in Revelation, there's a verse that says, the bride readies herself. In other words, the bride is getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want you to listen to me. You know, I come from India, and in India, a wedding is a feast. Uh, it's a festival. It happens for a few days. Sometimes it's up to a week. Relatives from all over will come and stay in the bride's house. And the relatives will be taking care of the bride, getting her ready for that wedding day. Now, uncles and aunties and many aunties and cousins will all come. There will, be a, there will be a lunch and dinner and breakfast and, and sleepovers and parties all happening. But all this excitement so that the bride is getting ready for that day, that auspicious day where she will meet the bridegroom. Now, I want you to think about this. That's the season you and I are in. This is not the season for us to be quiet. This is not the season for us to be depressed ostracized. This is the season for us to have a party. This is the season for us to really believe that God, this is the best days for the church. Glorious days as we prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. This is a season for us to go declare to the world, the bridegroom is coming, the bride is getting ready. Come join the party. I want you to listen to me carefully, church. That's why you and I have this blessed hope. The second thing that Jesus will make right in his coming is the prisoner will be put in prison. The prisoner will one day be locked up. Who's the prisoner? Satan, the devil. The Bible says 
in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, I want you to think about this. The devil's destination is that eternal fire. The devil will one day be put in prison. That prison is the eternal fire. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for mankind. But people who do reject Christ and people who walk in rebellion will one day join with the devil. But I want you to listen to me carefully. The devil is running rampant today. Yet he's on a leash. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation, for a period of seven years, God will give that Satan the power to deceive the nations. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. One day, that devil that is on a leash today will be unleashed in the book of Revelation during the great tribulation period. And at, at, the, at the end of that tribulation period, it, at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, devil will be thrown into the eternal fire. I want you to listen to me. One day this prisoner will be put in prison. Oh, today he is running rampant and he does a lot of atrocities. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. He comes to deceive. He's, a, he's the father of lies. And he comes to weaken the nations. Today we go through all of that. But one day that account will be settled. Hallelujah. That is the blessed hope. The bride will be with his bridegroom. And the prisoner will be put in prison. And thirdly, the king will be on his throne. In other words, one day Jesus will be crowned as King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the nations of this world, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and He establishes His millennial rule. His, he established His eternal kingdom right here and He will rule. Now, many people doubt whether that is a literal kingdom being established. See, for thousands of years, the church has been praying this. What do we pray? He taught us to pray this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. One day that prayer will be answered. His kingdom is coming and the king will be crowned and he will be on his throne. Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings, and the Lord of Lords. One thing you have to know is that this Jesus that we believe in, he's the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He's the Lord of all kings and the King of all lords, hallelujah. And one day he will take his rightful place as ruler and he will reign in this world, praise God. The third thing that this blessed hope does in our lives is that it unifies us. It unifies the people of God. As we near the return of our Lord Jesus, the one thing that is paramount is that the church of Jesus Christ should unite together. We should fellowship together. We should come together regularly to encourage, to edify, and to prepare ourselves for His coming. Because in the last leg of the last days, the thing that will, many people will neglect is the assembly. Isn't that what the Bible says? In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25, let us consider how to stir up one another and to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. One of the core things that you and I need to recognize is as we live in the last leg of the last days, we need each other. We need each other to spur each other on, to stir up the good works within us, to stir that godly faith within us, to keep us in the path of righteousness. We need, we need the community of believers. Can I ask you humbly that in the year 2023, that you would prioritize gathering together with the saints, whether it is in your small groups, or whether it's at Sunday services, I want you to prioritize this above all else. Why? Because this 
is what God has given us. As we get ready for the coming of the Lord, we need to encourage each other. As the days are darker and darker, we need each other. So come together and stir up one another so that we can pursue God wholeheartedly and love Him with all our heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. As we do this, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12 and verse 13, Paul writes this. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Looks into that. He says, as the Lord Jesus is coming with his saints, one of the core things that you and I need to do, he's speaking to the church that will live in the last leg of the last days. He says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. One of the things that the Bible says in the last days will grow cold is the love of many. But the Bible says you and I need to increase and abound in love. Secondly, not only we increase and abound in love, we need to be established in our heart and we need to be blameless in holiness. This is why you and I need the church of Jesus Christ. Shall we make a commitment in 2023? that we will continue to meet together in our small groups, continue to meet together on Sundays for fellowship, that we will receive the word of God, that we will increase, that the Lord will increase our love for one another. And he will also establish our heart blameless in holiness before him. And the people of God said, amen and amen. And the last thing the blessed hope does in our life is that it challenges us the blessed hope that challenges us. To do what? To do only one thing. See church, when you and I transit from this material world into the spiritual world, all the things that the material world, people prioritize, people run after, people take pride in, will not matter in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, things that matter are eternal things not temporal things. So what are the things that are eternal that is appreciated in the spiritual world? There's only one thing, the souls of men. So can I humbly ask you this question? One day when you stand before God at His coming, will you have the confidence to run before Him and to say, Lord Jesus, I'm not the only one who came. Look at all these people who came because I invested my life in them. See, Paul had this picture in mind in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. See, 1 Thessalonians is written about the rapture of the church. It, it, is a, it is an episode that speaks, that discusses the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in detail. And within that context, he says this, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? I want you to think about this. What would be the boasting? What would be the joy? What would be the crown? What would be the hope that you have when you stand before Christ at His coming? Is how many you have brought with you. So can I humbly ask you this question, that in this year, 2023, would you prioritize soul winning? Would you prioritize making a difference in the lives of people who are with you at your university or school or workplace or your neighborhood? That you would write down a list of people that God has placed in your sphere of influence. R develop that blessed list that you write down the names and you start to pray for them that God will open their heart to the gospel. That, you would, that God will give you a divine appointment and an inroads into their life to speak and to sow the gospel, to declare your hope, to share your story in their life. I want you to listen to me carefully. This is the season for us to do soul winning. That's why as a church, we are getting ready as we launch this year, 2023, we're getting ready to reach the neighborhoods where God has placed us. There's always been three things in our heart. Nations, neighborhoods, and next generation. All these three things have always motivated us to live for the gospel. 
to take the gospel that we believe in and to keep declaring this gospel, proclaiming this gospel among the nations, among our neighborhoods and the next generation. So would you please take this time to write down a blessed list even as we begin this year, say to the Lord, Lord, give me an opportunity to speak the word of God. Give me an opportunity to share the gospel with my neighbor, with my school friends, with my uni friends, with my workmates. Give me an opportunity and see how God answers that prayer. The word of God says in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and whoever captures souls is wise. Whoever captures souls is wise. One day when we stand before Jesus, I hope that we don't come empty handed. I hope that we have the confidence before him that we can show him these other people. Hallelujah. And that's what Paul meant when he says, a hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Is it not you? Praise God. In closing, let me say this church. We are living in the last leg of the last days. So I only have one important question to ask you. Are you waiting for the blessed hope of his coming? Do you have the assurance that the first time when Jesus came, he came to die for your sin, that your sins have been placed upon him, that he is the sacrifice that pleased the father, that was accepted by the Lord. And as a result, today you are forgiven. Not only that you are forgiven, that you have this assurance that he is coming again for you. That when he returns, he's going to gather you to himself and you're going to be his bride forever and ever. If you do not have that assurance, can I humbly ask you to pray this prayer with me? Because if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day for you to receive him. Today is the day for you to acknowledge that Jesus is my savior. Why? Because at his second coming, there is no more salvation. First time he came as the savior of the world. Second time he comes as the righteous judge. So you and I are called to live in this present age that we are called to come back to him. We are called to repent of our sin. We are called to live a godly life. We are called to dedicate our life for His glory. We are called to proclaim His gospel. We are called to call the nations and the neighborhoods and the next generation to Himself. We are here on His behalf, imploring people to come to Christ. Now is the time. When He comes again, it's too late. Church, I want to ask you this one question. Are you waiting for the blessed hope of his coming? Do you have the assurance in your heart that your sins are forgiven? The Bible says Jesus appeared the first time to bring salvation. He came to die for our sins. He came to redeem us unto himself. Now today, as people who are redeemed, we live in the light of that second coming. We know that this blessed hope that he is coming again for us. So we have this assurance that he is coming again for us. Therefore, we prepare ourselves. We purify ourselves. We encourage and comfort ourselves. And we challenge ourselves to go sow the gospel to the world. I want you to listen to me carefully. Do you have that assurance in your heart this morning? If you do not have that assurance, I want you to get your life right with Christ because his coming is imminent. If you're a person who has never placed your faith in Christ, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. I want you to acknowledge before God that you are a sinner. The moment you acknowledge that you are a sinner, you need a savior. You cannot save yourself with your good works. You cannot save yourself with your moral behavior. You got to come and be converted. You got to be washed and cleansed by the blood that is pure. And the only sinless blood is the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, who came 2,000 years ago, lived the life that you could never live, but died the death that you deserved. And the wrath of God, the judgment of God was poured upon him. And because he died, you can live. And if you confess that Jesus is my Savior, and if you believe that Jesus died for my sin, the Word of God says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus died for you, you will be saved. 
whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So this morning, would you take this opportunity to do that? If you're ready, then repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that Jesus is my Savior. He died for my sin. His blood paid the penalty for my sin. Today, I acknowledge Jesus as my Savior. I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord. I want to live for Him. I want to be with Him. So Lord Jesus, receive me as your own. Come live in my heart and change me from within that I will live for the glory of God and for the good of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Church, if you prayed that prayer, I sincerely believe that you are born again. Now you need to find a Bible living church, a Bible preaching church that you can be part of, be planted there and continue in your discipleship journey to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to serve Jesus, to abide in Jesus and to become more and more like Jesus. But for the rest of us, church, let me encourage you that in this year, 2023, that you will continue to wait for that blessed hope and let that blessed hope purify you. Let that blessed hope comfort you. Let that blessed hope challenge you to rise up and do the will of the Father. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this blessed new year. In this blessed new year, help us to continually live with that blessed hope that Jesus is coming again for us, that indeed the bride will reunite with the bridegroom and we will be with him forever. Father, today I pray your blessing upon your church. Watch over us, protect us and provide for us and continually get us ready for the coming of the Lord. And may this year be filled with your peace, your favor, your goodness upon the church. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you shalom. Go in His peace, church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you. God bless you. Take care.